Okay. Everybody, yeah, take your seats, please. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I'm Barbara Slave, and I direct the Future of Iran Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. And, and we have an absolute treat today. I mean, I know we're all focusing on very weighty topics, and we certainly do here. Uh, uh, sanctions, the Iranian nuclear program, regional tensions, the, the latest protests within Iran. But one of the core goals of the Future of Iran Initiative has always been to promote uh, a deeper understanding of Iranian culture and society, uh, and also to support efforts to improve relations between the people of Iran and the people of the United States. So we have quite a story for you today. We're going to discuss uh, a rare good news story between the U.S. and Iran, the return of many pages um, of a precious medieval copy of the Shahnameh. And I know this is a knowledgeable audience, but for those of you out there who don't know what the Shahnameh is, it's the Book of Kings. Um, I was rereading over the last few days uh, an excellent translation by Dick Davis of the Shahnameh, and uh, there's an introduction by the Iranian-American writer Azar Nafisi. She quotes her father, Ahmed, who put together uh, a selection of stories from the Shahnameh uh, for children. And her father, according to Azar, says that Persians do not have a home except in their literature, especially their poetry. And she writes, the Shahnameh is our home, the golden thread that links one Persia to another. Um, I just thought that was the perfect thing to think about now at a time when Iranians both in this country and other countries and Iranians in Iran uh, are so divided politically. Uh, this is the one thing that connects all Iranians and lovers of Iran, and that is pride in the great cultural achievements of this country. In, in the Shahnameh, we have tales of legendary and actual kings, of bravery, revenge, ambition, abuse of power, passion, foreign invasion, treachery. It's, it's Game of Thrones, a, a millennium before George R.R. R. Martin wrote it, and complete with dragons and demons. Um, it's striking to me, too, uh, you know, as a non-Iranian, how many names in the Shahnameh are still the names that people give their children, that Iranians give their children, especially their sons. Rostam, Sohrab, Siamak, Jamshid, Sarush, Feridun. Um, it, it's, a, it's a work that, that speaks to us today and certainly speaks to, to all Iranians. Um, so why are we talking about the Shahnameh today? Well, our special guest is uh, former diplomat Arthur Houghton, who knows better than most the importance of the Shahnameh. In 1994, after the death of his father, he helped engineer the return of surviving illuminated pages of a 16th century Shahnameh to Iran. He had visited Iran before the revolution, uh, never after, but last spring, he returned to Iran as part of a documentary that's being put together on this whole extraordinary story. Um, you have his biography, I believe, in the, the papers you picked, out, uh, picked up outside, but just very briefly. Um, he's a former Foreign Service officer who has held positions in uh, Beirut, Amman, and Cairo, and the State Department, as well as serving on the National Security Council. But he's really a Renaissance man. He was associate curator and curator in charge of the Department of Antiquities of the J. Paul Getty Museum uh, before returning to public service as international policy director in the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy in the 1990s. In 1995, he left government to, found, to found a consulting firm. Uh, he has written, let's see, uh, new, four books, yes, and is currently a novelist. He has a BA and MA from Harvard. He has a degree from the American University of Beirut and the Middle East Center for Arab Studies. And he's also served on numerous boards. Um, I, I can't think of a more interesting person to talk about a story like this. So please join me in welcoming Arthur Houghton to the Atlantic Council. Houghton, sorry. Houghton. Oh, 
Barbara, thank you for the lovely introduction. Do you want me to sit yes, here? I, uh, I think I'll stand up if I may. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Okay, if you like. Thank yep. you. All right. You know, the interesting person she described is obviously a person who can't hold a steady job. <laughs> um, you know, I'm so happy to see so many of you here. So many of my friends have come out of the woodwork for this particular moment. I must tell you, I came here with a certain sense of apprehension because a lot of people in this room and who are listening today know so much more about Iran than I do. The question that I had is how do I make it, how do I add value to this? I sort of felt for a moment like um, Elizabeth Taylor's seventh husband on his wedding night. I think I know what to do, but how do I make it interesting? <laughs> Let me take you back a thousand years to um, a man named Abel Qasim Ferdowsi, who lived in a city called Tus, not far from Mashhad in northeastern Iran, and who was a poet of enormous renown. Between the end of the 10th century and beginning of the 11th century, he began to compose a poem which became the longest poem in the history of man. 50,000 couplets, a hundred thousand lines. Tradition says that he was paid a, one gold piece for every couplet he wrote by the Sultan of Ghazni. Well, if you, want to, if you want to have gold pieces, you write a lot of lines, and he did. He composed what was in effect, as Barbara has described to you, uh, the national epic of Iran, an extraordinary document in itself that was reproduced many, many times over the next centuries. But nothing, nothing was done to approach what happened when in the 1530s, 1520s, 1530s, the then Shah of Iran, Ismail, commissioned the court artist at Tabriz to illustrate the most sumptuous and beautiful volume that had ever been created. He did this, it is said, as a way of establishing, um, uh, at least presenting himself as a monarch of power, of a stable uh, 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 government, someone who could bring together the greatest artists in the land in order to illustrate the most famous poem that had ever been created in Iranian history, in Persian history, forgive me. In, 16, in 1587, his son, Shah Tamas, gave it to, Sultan, uh, to the Sultan in, uh, in Istanbul, Selim II. Now, there's a story behind this, which is that the Shah Nama, which is a large volume, we're talking about 25 inches by 13 inches and so forth on a side, 759 pages. 257 paintings, absolutely gorgeous, was bound up and sent on in a caravan that included 400 government officials, 30 businessmen, and 17,000 camels. Now you can ask why there are so many camels and I have no idea. I can't give you an idea except they had to eat somehow. Um, it arrived in Istanbul and disappeared for the next four centuries, and then mysteriously reappeared in Paris in the hands of the Rothschild family. Um, Baron Edmond de Rothschild, no, Richard de Rothschild, um, actually exhibited it in 1903 in Paris in an exhi exhibition of Islamic art, and it disappeared again. It was picked up along with other treasures from the Rothschild family by the Nazis in 1940 and taken off to Neuschweinstein Castle for his safekeeping. It was returned to the Rothschilds after the war, 1945, 1946, and then again reappeared, this time in New York, the year is 1953, and it rested in the hands of a book dealer there uh, for sale. This is where the story begins to change. A book collector who knew nothing about Persian art, in fact, knew nothing about Islamic art whatsoever, was asked to take a look at it by a professor of Islamic art at Harvard, and he did, and fell in love with it. That was my father. 
he bought it. And in 1959, uh, he concluded the deal to buy this entire volume of the Chardonnay brought it into his own household. I began to see elements of this, because what had happened was that the Harvard professor, Kerry Welch, had asked him for the right to publish it, which meant that it had to be disassembled, unbacked, each page separately copied, each painting separately photographed, so that it could be published and republished by, uh, uh, within the next few years. Well, that began the, that began the, um, uh, uh, the destruction of, the, uh, of this extraordinary work of art. In time, my father, who was president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, gave 76 pages, 78 paintings to the Metropolitan. This is the first great disassembly of this extraordinary work of art, which he then gave to the Metropolitan. And of course, in time, when he filed his tax returns, they were questioned, how can you say that it reached this particular value? And so he had to sell individual objects from the remaining pages of the Chaname. Five years later, seven of them went for sale at Christie's in New York. And uh, remarkably, the prices reached levels which are unheard of since that time. The most expensive folio of all reached the sum of $525,000, which is exactly one and a half times. This is one folio, reached $525,000, which was one and a half times what he paid for the entire thing in 1959. It must have fascinated him that this could have happened, and so further sales took place. This is a dark story, and um, by the time of his death in 1970, what remained were 116 paintings plus 500 some odd pages of manuscript and two beautiful bindings. But it still was the most extraordinarily beautiful and remarkable uh, work of art that had remained in his hands up until that particular point. I was asked at that point if I would engage myself with the possible sale of that. The trustees of his estate turned to me. I'd had some experience in the art market because I'd served in the Getty Museum. And my response was, sure, I'll take a look at it. I have no idea where this will go. Uh, we're now at the beginning of 1971. And so I went to London, which is the center of the Islamic art market, and began to ask questions. There were no answers, no immediate answers. But I was directed, my attention was directed toward an individual who's considered to be the finest Islamic art dealer in existence, a man called Oliver Hoare, the English banking family. And Oliver knew what he was talking about. He was the only person who'd actually handled page after page after page the entire document from beginning to end. He knew what was going on. He knew what it was about. He said, I can't help you at the moment, but I may get back to you, and he did. Six months later, he asked me if I would be interested in having this, what remained of the Chardonnay, still this extraordinarily ex exquisite work of art, um, return to Iran. It would mean engaging with the Iranian government in a discussion that who knows where it would go. And would it bother me? And I said yeah, to myself, I said, you better would bother me. I'm serving in the White House, and I'll be thrown out in the street if it would discover that I was dealing with Iran in any manner, shape, or form, even through an intermediary. But I said, Oliver, go ahead. This is more important than both of us, so please begin the discussion. There was a period of time that I had to ask myself, what was I looking for in this? What, what, did I, what, what were my responsibilities? On one hand, I had the legal responsibility of having as much money generated by the sale of the Chaname as possible for the estate of my father. But there was something else that was going on at the same time. There was a sort of a moral issue of not breaking it up further, <coughs> holding it together, and making it certain that it was whatever became of it, whoever the end buyer was, that they received it in its currently, that 
currently partial, but nevertheless partially complete form. And I began to feel a sort of tugging in it going on at my sort of ankles, as if I were in a stream of water that was beginning to roll, uh, run deeper and deeper as I went on. In a sense, I was no longer entirely in charge of what was taking place. I was being, a sense, being made captive by the Shahnameh itself. And so when Oliver said, let's see if we can take this to Iran, I said to myself, that's not a bad idea. And over time, two and a half years later, Oliver let me know in a call from Paris that the Iranians had agreed to buy it and buy it for a sum of money that was equivalent to what was, was then appraised for, approximately what it was then appraised for. And so off it went. It went from London, where the, it had been kept in uh, a bank vault, to Paris for inspection, and from Paris to Vienna, where a plane that was sent by the president of Iran came to pick it up. Now, the Iranians had their own problem. Actually, they had two problems. One of them was me. Uh, first of all, they believed that somehow I not acting, was not acting in a personal uh, uh, context, that somehow I, I was probably, because of my background, State Department, White House, two terms and so forth, and current employment in the White House, I was probably working on behalf of the American government for some unstated and unknowable purpose, but there may have been a conspiracy behind it. They took the risk, as they were talking to themselves about it, of dealing with me and therefore, in their view, with the Iranian government in order to recover this extraordinary work of art. Um, the other problem they had was how to pay for it. Well, they couldn't put it into the budget. You can't just pony up ten and a half million dollars from the budget of a country that's in the throes of recovery from its, the uh, war with Iraq. What they needed to do was to find something that they could exchange or believe could be exchanged for this. And so they began to look through the art collections in Tehran itself. There are some extraordinary works of art that, were, that are currently in the Museum of Contemporary Art, and they began to look through these. And they finally found one. First of all, the, um, uh, they, the, the, they needed advice, and so what they did was they found a group of art advisors who came to talk to them about what they had and let them know what was important or not. I think I should, at this point, at, let you see something of what's going on uh, with respect to the Shahnameh, if I can only find my little okay. knick-knack here. This is one page. It's a page of the... This is not, I, I need to have a second. No, let me start this one again. At the beginning. At the beginning, that's what we're looking at. This yes, is I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do the next one, I'm gonna do the, the blow up. Again, this is not working, can you? Okay, stop there if you can. Thank you. Can I have that back? Or maybe I'll ask. Yeah, but thank you. Uh, that's exactly what I'll do. To give you a sort of a sense of the exquisite nature of this remarkable, remarkable work of art, this is a single page. Or actually, this is a, a blow up of a single page. The detail is remarkable. This, by the way, was taken photographed out of a book which is about this size. And you can imagine what the degree, the degree of detail that's visible in the original painting itself. This particular one is in the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. So the Iranians, or the Iranian team, which is led by the then Deputy Minister of Culture, a man called Mahdi Hojad, had to take a long look through their inventory of art to try to find something that would be of approximately equivalent value. And they found something, this. This is a painting by Willem de Kooning, 1953, one of the f series of five women paintings that he did in that particular year. 
<laughs> and they took a long look at it and decided that this could never, ever be exhibited in the Islamic Republic, first of all. Mm -hmm. Second, <laughs> a, a, imagine a, 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 a frontally nude woman. It could, this is it brutally done in de Kooning's traditional style with great black slashes through it. I asked an Iranian who had been part of the team um, that had uh, uh, involved themselves in the transfer of the Shahnameh. I said, well, why this painting? Is it because it was of a, of a, of a, of a nude woman? He said, no, not at all. It's it, because it was, of a, it was a, a portrait of a, of, a, of a degraded woman, degraded in a manner we could never, ever see ourselves loving this or even liking it. In fact, I was told after that that they would have gotten rid of a couple of others of these if they possibly could. Anyway, so the de Kooning came out. It was valued at artificially at a $20 million. The Shahnameh was valued artificially at $20 million, and an exchange was made. Neither, no one had any idea what this was really worth, and nobody had any idea what the Shahnameh or the remnants of the remaining Shahnameh was worth. Well, the deal was done, and so that's the end of the story. Well, it's not, nothing, in my experience, uh, there's no such thing as an end of a story. Something always happens to bring it back to you. And four years ago, I was informed by a friend of mine that he had a movie producer who would like to do a documentary film on the entire process of creation of the Shahnameh, the transfer to Istanbul and the transfer them there to the United States is purchased and returned to Iran. It's a nice story, he said. Would you be like to be involved in this? And I said, well, tell me what I need to know. He said, well, the first thing you need to know is you're going to have to go back to Iran. And you're going to have to go back to Iran and be filmed there over a course of time. And so I went. Um, last May, uh, I found myself being filmed over the course of six days in Iran. I was asked to give interviews. I was asked to give a stand-up talk. I was asked to be part of a panel discussion. Um, it was a very, very high visibility trip. As someone told me, it was the highest visibility trip any American had made to Iran since the revolution. Well, that got people excited. One of the group of people that got excited was the Revolutionary Guards. And so the day before my departure, I was with my wife at the time, both of us were called in to be interrogated by the intelligence organization of the Revolutionary Guards. Well, that was an interesting event. Um, they eventually released us, released me, released her after asking me a number of questions, and then I left Iran. A film is being made of this in short. In time, don't ask me when how or how long this is going to take. If you know anything about Hollywood, don't hold your breath. But it's still in process. It's, being, it's been sold to a, one of the Holly, major Hollywood studios. It will appear either in serial form or in single form. My hope is that it will be done in a manner where it can be viewed in Iran itself. The problem with dealing with movies in Iran is that my understanding is that only Iranian films are shown. Only Iranian music is sung, is used, and so forth. It goes on and on and on. Foreign influences are not welcome. If this is done correctly, and I tried to make the point to the Hollywood studio two weeks ago when I was there, if they would make certain that this was acceptable, do it in some manner where this would be viewable in Iran, this movie in itself has the possibility, I told them, which is my pitch, of actually changing the nature of the relationship between the United States and Iran itself. <laughs> well, that was, my, that was the way I presented it to them. I would like to see this done. This is the end of my short story about the Shahnameh, my engagement in it, and, my, um, and the nature of the reason, the reason that I was, uh, 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 went to Iran. I have other observations for it, but maybe, you know, this is one of those things we can talk about now. Absolutely. Thanks. Now? By the way, I want to take this horrible thing off. <laughs> Please have a seat.
Thank you so much. I mean, when I, I, I was not aware of this story until uh, Kristen Fontenrose, who is a colleague of mine here at the Atlantic Council and once worked with you, uh, told me something of this story. And uh, I thought it was, um, you know, we, we concentrate so much on everything that has gone wrong between the U.S. and Iran and the lack of cooperation and the lack of engagement that uh, this, this is a rare good news story between the two countries. But first, I want to clarify, your father died in 1990, right? 90. Okay, you said 1970, so 1990. And this, of course, as you pointed out, was when Iran was just emerging from the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, and yes, obviously, they wanted back a cultural treasure, but there was something more involved. This was a, a possibility, a way of engaging right, with the West at a time when Iran wanted better relations with the West. So I would love your, your reflections. You mentioned that you had a, a, uh, an interview with the SIPA, with the Revolutionary Guard intelligence people, but you also spent a little bit of time speaking to Iranians, traveling in Iran. Tell us something about your trip to Iran last spring and how the country had changed from your previous trips before the revolution. Let, let me go back for a moment. I, 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 I don't think the, uh, the, the, the engagement with the Shahnameh at the time reflected any conscious decision by the Iranian government to engage with the West. The entire matter was carried out in secret, in deep secret. Really? Because for several reasons, one of which is because they didn't want to be found that they were giving something away. That is, for example, out of their own inventory, the de Kooning painting. Two, they were dealing with somebody who was obviously working for the United States government. Okay. And thirdly, the entire idea of dealing with the United States at any level whatsoever, I think at that point would have been anathema to a lot of Iranians. At that point. Now, I, I would like to think this has changed to a little, to a certain extent. You want to know my impressions of Iran itself. I'll give you them not necessarily in order. First of all, the Iran that I saw this time is obsessed with the United States. That is, somehow Iranians feel or devoutly believe that the United States is cast a shadow over their lives, broadly speaking. Our policies, the way we behave, um, the sanctions, the consequences of the sanctions are with them every single day. I was asked on arrival about my views of, of our president. I was not likely to give them, but nevertheless, um, I was asked that two or three times after I arrived uh, in Iran, again and again and <coughs> repeatedly, um, what does the, the United States want from us? What, what can we do to help? And unfortunately, I was not in a position to give, give any positive answers whatsoever. Um, other impressions. Um, there are small changes taking place that suggest a slight opening up of Iranian society from what other people would consider to be a, a sense of oppression of the Islamic State upon its own citizenry. The, all women wear scarves in public, but the scarves are slowly giving way. They, more hair is being shown. Um, I watched a woman on a motorcycle and was told no woman ever rides a motorcycle. This is a new event that's going on. There are all sorts of little indications like this that somehow things are now tolerated where they weren't tolerable or acceptable before. There are surprises in Iran, one way or the other. Um, I was surprised, but it's, you know, this, is, this is a, almost sounds trivial, but it's not in a sense. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a national characteristic. I have never seen a country that was so absolutely spotlessly clean. Every restaurant, every restroom, every place I ever went was absolutely clean down to a whistle, only at one truck stop was there a restroom that was slightly less than that, but everywhere else, more than any other country I've ever seen, certainly more than any in Europe, any part of the United States, or most countries in Asia. I can't explain it. There's a dichotomy also, that is, for example, Iranians appear to exist in two different worlds. 
on the one hand, there's the Iran of the Islamic Republic that's devoutly religious and that adheres to the fundamentalist rules of behavior. And there's the other Iran where if, you're, if, you, if, you, if you are privileged to have the opportunity to do this, you live in another world. You have a um, television that can bring in multiple channels, um, any movie that you want to. I had a, 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 a glass of wine and a bottle of scotch offered to me at a dinner one evening. There's, a, there's this sense of living at different levels. But there's still this sort of sense that somehow um, there's this overlay of, um, of, 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 of authority. To give you an example, a woman whom I won't mention, who's been out of Iran multiple times, has been hauled before a court in Iran to explain why she removed her scarf when she was out of the country. That doesn't happen normally or routinely, but this is somebody who herself was somebody of very high visibility in any event. And so, again, she's somebody who was watched. As many people accept the fact that they are watched, they're observed, and their communications are monitored. I could go on. I don't think I, 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 I mean, I could, I could go on, but there, go ahead. Were there any things that, that, you had visited Iran, we spoke earlier, and you said you'd visited Iran yes. before the revolution. Right. You're, you're an Arabist by training, but you had, uh, had gone to Iran before the revolution. So what struck you as the same about the place or about the people, apart from the cleanliness? I don't know, was it as clean before? I assume it was as well. well but uh, uh, great question. I, uh, what struck me was that, uh, that the change was so, so, so multiple and so large that I, it was, an uh, to me, a country that was unrecognizable um, from the one that I was first went there in 1964. Um, at Tehran, at that point, my recollection was a the sort of a undistinguished, um, low-level, rather dusty, sort of yellow <laughs> city, a brick city. And um, today, it's a huge metropolis of eight million people with gigantic um, uh, buildings, wonderful architecture backed up against the El Bors Mountains. Um, there is a, there's a, there's a sense of, um, uh, there's a sense of pride and self-worth there that I didn't detect before. That is somehow we are, we are Persians, we are Iranians, and we are important. And by the way, this is the other side of the coin, we can't stand you Americans in your policy, but you know, in the end, um, take a look at us, we're doing quite well, aren't we? Hmm. Um, there's a basically the sort of sense that Iran itself was a, a state in being with its own sense of national pride and order. Um, and it was, it, it, it's quite refreshing to see. I would say, you know, by the way, the infrastructure is remarkable. The roads are extraordinary across the country. There are... Um, Where did you go? What, uh, what different places did you go? I'm sorry? You, 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 you went to Tehran, but you also went to Isfahan. Yes, I, mean, yeah. I, I was in Iran, I was in Isfahan, I was the, the happy attendant at an anti-American demonstration. <laughs> um, <laughs> There are three national days, I should tell you, three days of anti-American demonstrations. One at uh, the uh, uh, anniversary of the revolution, another the anniversary of the seizure of the American embassy. The third is called Al-Quds Day, when both Israel and the United States combined are objects of demonstrations. This is one of those wonderful Last moments. Last Friday in Ramadan. That's right. There we go. That's at the end of Ramadan. No, during Ramadan. Yeah, last Friday right. last in Friday during in Ramadan. Ramadan. Yeah. And so, um, and so, you know, there's one of those moments when people would turn, I during a demonstration, people would turn to us and say, well, where are you from? To which the answer is, well, you know, we're from the United States. Oh, we're so happy to see you. <laughs> we <laughs> Can we photograph our baby with you? <laughs> this kind of thing went on repeatedly. Uh, the Iranians we met, to a person, were gracious, thoughtful, considerate. What can I tell you? Yeah. Um, there are other things. I mean, for example, <laughs> I, there was a moment when I visited the largest mosque in existence, the Mosala, which whose sanctuary can hold one million people. And on the day that I was there, this is the day after Ramadan, on the Eid, during a prayer, I was the invited guest. 
There were one million Iranians and one American. Jeez. <laughs> But I was invited. Again, this is one of the things that was, must have been taken note of by our yeah. friends, the Revolutionary Guards. I have to just you know, uh, tell you my own anecdote. Um, I was at uh, February 11th, Revolutionary, Revolution Day, uh, when Ahmadinejad had just been inaugurated as president. And he was giving his first speech for February 11th. And of course, it was death to America. And they were burning effigies of George W. Bush and so on. And, uh, I was with a bunch of journalists and uh, some young girls, high school girls, junior high school girls were wearing these placards, you know, against the U.S. and saying that nuclear energy was their natural right. Um, and one of them looked at me and saw that I was not Iranian, asked me where I was from. And when I told them I was from America, right, they started asking me for my autograph. Yeah. So I, I titled the first chapter of my book, Death to America and Can I Have Your Autograph? <laughs> Which to me sums up the schizophrenia in the Islamic Republic. We have a wonderful audience of your friends and colleagues and people very knowledgeable about these subjects. So I would invite anyone who would like to, to ask a, a question, raise your hand and wait for the microphone. Say your name and ask a question. How? And, and speak up uh, so that uh, our guests can hear. Push the button. Hello. Uh, I'm Faye Mokhtar. I'm a member of Atlantic Council. Barbara, thank you so much for this excellent program. And thank you, sir, for being here. Um, I have a question for you, sir. Uh, this exchange with uh, Wilhelm de Kooning, a painting, was this a fair exchange? And how much, in your opinion, the Wilhelm de Kooning painting works right now? So Thank was you. this a fair exchange uh, of paintings? How much do you think the William de Kooning is worth? Well, you know, this is, now. Uh, again, it's, 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 like, it's like evaluating any work of art. It's uh, almost impossible to do. Let me give you an example why. The de Kooning painting, which, which I showed you, was valued nominally at $20 million as it left the country. It was last sold about eight years ago for $152 million. Wow. Now stop there for a second. The Sean M.A., which as it left our hands, was valued, we valued it at $10.5 million, $11 million. Um, they valued it nominally at 20 in order to make the change appear equal. Um, one page, one folio of the Sean M.A. went on sale in 2014 for $21 million. Wow. It, it's, it's, it's literally impossible to know how to value this thing at all. It's th the only thing to say is the de Kooning, I promise you, is not priceless, but the Shanama surely is. Do you know where the remaining pages of the Shanama are exhibited now in Iran? Are they, no. they're are, are they, they're hidden they away? Not. Can people see them or? There was going to be an exhibit before uh, <coughs> b at, that was to have taken place in October. I don't know if it took place, but none of them were an exhibit when I was there. They were kept very, very carefully in the basement of the Contemporary Art Museum. And to show you how careful they were, I did handle the pages, but I was instructed not only to wear latex gloves, but also a face mask mm -hmm. so that my breath wouldn't get on them. Yeah. Uh, and the largest collection that we can see in this country is in the Metropolitan Museum, I take That's it, right. still. There are 78 paintings there. Okay. Yeah. Gentlemen here. <coughs> My name is Timothy Towell, a retired Foreign Service officer, and more importantly, a friend of Arthur Houghton's for a zillion years. <laughs> My comment and question is about Iran and the United States of America, Iran and the West, and in war and peace, not oil that the man down the street with a hairdo talks about all the time. <laughs> uh, this is very important for peace. Why? Because Iran is not Syria, Iraq, and other places. When British soldiers and French soldiers after World War I sat down before having a cocktail and got on a map and divided think stuff up as if they're playing Monopoly, Iraq, Iran was Persia, a civilization. Not only the wonderful civilization that you've shown us, civilization of algebra and other 
scientific things. It's very important to make the difference. This is a great culture, so ill-bred people don't just trash Iran. You have to deal with an important country, and you have to do it culturally, artistically, as well as rattling your, your weapons. <laughs> so this is very important, and you have to keep doing this and doing this and doing this, sir, in my humble opinion. Thank you, Tim. Here, here. Uh, th this, is, this is my friend, Timothy Towell, former ambassador to Bolivia, former foreign service officer, many, many things, an erudite man, if there ever was one. If there was a question in there, my answer, response is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, was the question, yeah. your answer is correct. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to also just gently, not, not correct, but you said it in 1994 this was a secret exchange, and I accept that. But in 1995, Rafsanjani offered a major contract to the American oil company Conoco. Um, so I do believe this was part of a time when Iran was. I mean, the fact that, that this deputy minister of culture had the courage to, to do this exchange um, suggests that there was, first of all, that he had approval from Rafsanjani, clearly, and the supreme leader, probably, Khamenei, but that there was more behind this than, than just simply getting back some pages of, of, of the Shahnameh. Yeah, yes, you're right. I, he did have actually had approval from Khamenei, uh, uh, and um, it was, um, but nevertheless, the, none of them wanted to be exposed sure. on this one at all, if you sure. can imagine properly. Sure. Let me give you a backstory on this one. Um, in terms of exposure. The person with whom I dealt, Oliver Hoare, in the United Kingdom, um, was absolutely extraordinary in terms of his ability to deal with not only Iranians, but also me. I'm a sort of a cantankerous guy. <laughs> but there was something else going on in the background that broke open a week and a half after the transaction actually took place. It was revealed that he had been a, a shall we say, a very, very good friend of Princess Diana, Ooh. who, broken-hearted, after their romance had been cut off, after he cut off the romance, had called him again and repeatedly, hundreds of times, literally from a phone booth outside her apartment, her flat in London. Now, had that become known, while the deal was in progress, it would have broken apart. The Iranians were manic about not being exposed and manic about not being party to any scandal of any kind or the other. And this was a serious, major scandal. They did a long background investigation of my family and me to be sure that we were acceptable as partners. Uh, but boy, I've got to tell you, the, when the Oliver Hoare Diana thing broke open, it would have ended the entire process. Wow. Well. It would not have ended it. I think it would have ended it for the moment, because inevitably yeah. something would have happened that would have brought it back into play again. Do we have any other questions? I can't see with these. Ah, yes, uh, with these lights. Yes, uh, Patrick, is that? No, sorry, you, the gentleman there with the, yeah. And uh, I, uh, maybe we can, yeah. Uh, Nelson Cunningham, and ah. this room may have a lot of knowledgeable people. I am not one of them on this subject. Uh, yeah. My understanding of Islamic art was that it was not permissible to depict human figures. And so I'm wondering how oh. it is that the Shahnameh has such beautiful paintings of human figures. Yeah, that's better, if it was a work of, of at least Islamic inspired art or, or painted during the time when uh, Persia was Islamic. Yeah, well, uh, this was done when Iran was already becoming a Shia uh, state. And the Shia do not have the same prohibition on images, human images, that, that uh, strict Sunni uh, Muslims do. Uh, in fact, it's one of the points of contention between Sunni and Shia. And if you've been in Iran during Ashura, which is the, the high point of the, or the low point, <laughs> depending on your, your uh, perspective of the Shia calendar, uh, which commemorates the martyrdom of the Imam Hussein, there are images of the Imam Hussein everywhere, and Ali, of course, the, the founder of Shiism, and they look strangely like Jesus Christ. Um, and I always thought that um, Shah Ismail was influenced by Jesuit priests um, who, uh, who were in Iran around the same time that he decided that it would become a Shia nation as opposed to Sunni. 
to distinguish Iran from the Ottoman Turks who were, who were Sunni. So there is no, no such prohibition in, I guess, at that time when this Shahnameh was, was made. And of course, Persian miniatures, I mean, are a, a staple of the culture. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah. something, there's something else going on. Uh, to amend this slightly, sure. uh, there's a long uh, visual tradition in Turkey also, mm. as you know. Of the three great Islamic cultures, Turkey, Turkish and Iranian culture, they're full of visual images. But you know, it, the, the, the interesting thing is that Iranian art, or the representation of human beings in Iranian art, goes way back to the Achaemenians and before. You've got this long, long tradition that carries forward. And in every age, every period of Iranian Persian culture, there are representations of human beings all across the spectrum of possibility. Um, even including, um, even including nude figures, if you believe it, uh, under the Khadrars. Um, sure. I guess the point is, when you have a, a tradition of visual imagery, it, it's hugely powerful and it does carry forward. And I don't think that was the case with the Levantine Arabs or those in the peninsula. Well, certainly those not with the Africa. Saudis. I mean, you're thinking of Saudi Arabia where you can't show these sorts of, or at least until recently, I don't know, maybe MBS has changed that too, but. Yeah. Um, until recently, you couldn't show these representations. Um, I think, uh, I mean, you mentioned the long, the long tradition of, of, of showing these kinds of, uh, of images, um, but also the Shahnameh itself is Iran's way of uh, distinguishing itself uh, from the Arabs and from Islam. It, uh, it's, as you read it, there's, there are many references to religion but there are no references to Islam. There are references to God and to the devil, but not to Islam. And, and Arabs and Turks are treated as distinctly uh, uh, foreign and separate uh, ethnic groups as opposed to the Persians. Um, and of course, the writing of the Shahnameh preserved the Persian language uh, from the Arabs who had invaded and brought their religion, but never managed to, uh, to uh, foist their, their language completely on, on, on Persia. They, they brought their alphabet, but not their, their, their language, and the Shahnameh preserved it forever. I think I would add uh, one of the things that I picked up there was a sort of undercurrent of uh, not just discomfort, but almost loathing that Iranians and Arabs have for each other. <laughs> Uh, it it's, it's goes back a long, long way. I am absolutely certain in my own mind that we, the United States, Americans, and Iranians will be together again very closely at some point, but Iranians and Arabs, <laughs> it's been thousand, a thousand years and more yeah. in, make, in the making. Yes, there is. I can see you now with the light, not quite so. Yeah. Uh, regarding the uh, alphabet and all of that, let, yes. me, let me just add a couple of bits of information. Actually, prior to the uh, invading Arabs uh, bringing Islam, neither the grammar nor the uh, alphabet, Arabic alphabet, were um, put together. They, there was no work of that. So the, really? the Pers the, 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 there is a Persian uh, scholar, Ibn Sibuya, who actually put together the Arabic grammar. Really? I didn't know yes, that. Yes, after um, they arrived. And the same thing with, uh, if you look at the earliest Qur'ans, the alphabet looks completely different. The, the current uh, set of alphabets that you see with the dots and so yeah. on and so forth were also put together by the Persians. Did you hear that, that a Persian scholar actually created the alphabet that we know as the Arabic yeah. alphabet? Yeah. That's fascinating. Well, systematized, if you will. Yeah, systematized. Yeah. That's Thank fascinating. You. Yeah, gentlemen here, right here. Yeah. It's very difficult for me to express what I want to say. First of all, I really enjoyed what you talked about the Bashar al and so forth. My name is Ashke Adamiyat. I am the nephew of a Persian scholar by the name of Fereidun. What my question relates is... Can you hold the mic closer yeah. to that? What my question relates to is uh, the government in Iran 
is not really uh, pro stuff that has have something to do with Iranian nationality, meaning that they prefer Arabic, <coughs> anything that's Arabic. If you go to any city in Iran, you will see everything written, banners and everything are written in Arabic. Now, when you were deciding whether to exchange the Shahnameh with the Dukunik uh, painting, were you ever concerned that maybe the Iranians will not safe keep the Shahnameh? Was there any notion of discomfort okay. regarding that? Because they have destroyed a lot of uh, valuable historic uh, okay. stuff that are did, did pre, you get pre or Persian. Yeah. Uh, th w this, the short answer is is, is no. I have uh, every let me put it the following way. I have every confidence that the Iranians <coughs> probably, the Iranian government probably will take better care of the Shahnameh than any other country or any other group of people. I am absolutely certain of that. The way they handle it today, it's as if it were um, the most precious object they had ever handled. And I'm talking about, I mean, I went into the basement of the, um, of the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. You've got three vault doors you have to go through before you can pull them out. When they're out, you have people in near vicinity, all of them wearing surgical masks and gloves. Each of these pages is handled as if it, it, one page, is the most precious object they've ever touched in their life. Um, I've never seen this kind of care taken. I would add something else. One of the uh, surprising things about Iran, like no other country I've seen, takes extraordinary methods to keep visitors from from being close to objects of antiquity or art of any kind at all. Through the museums and through the antiquity sites of Iran, there is always a glass panel between you and the object in front of you, everywhere. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing to see. You cannot approach as you can in any Western museum, right up and look at the brushwork of a painting. It's going to be a foot and a half away from you. And that protects it all. All of it is protected. This was done, actually, at the instance of the person that I was dealing with, Mati Hojet, who was Deputy Minister of Culture. He created a cultural heritage, or heritage organization that actually decreed and provided the money for the protection of art and archaeology in Iran. Thank you. Yes, back there. Um, hello, my name is Joshua Hellinger. I'm a student at GW. And uh, I, would, I, was, I was very interested in the time when the book was in the possession of your father. And I would like to know, did you have personal contact with the book? How did your father keep it? Did he read it? Did he have it locked up in a, in a, in a vitrine? No, Are there some, some stories sure. about how, how it was in the possession of your family? This is, this is Josh, who's one of my students at GW. Um, he asked whether, when your father had the, the Shaname, did you uh, did you look at it? Were you able to read it? Did you know about it? Did you interact in no, any way I with not, it? Not time? immediately. Um, let, let me put it the wrong way. I, I knew he acquired it because he mentioned it to me. This is sometime after 1959. And sometime around 1961, 62, I began to see some of the paintings begin to go up in his office and at his home, including the Court of Guayamas, which you've seen here. Um, I don't think he had any understanding of what he had. And so um, he was a book collector. He was a, he was a person who understood books. He gave a great collection of Keats to Harvard and then a building to house it. He collected Lewis Carroll like nobody's business. He had two Gutenberg Bibles. It goes on and on and on. But the point of the matter is he looked at this as if it were a book rather than a work of art and an indivisible work of art. And, but I began to see it go up. Yes, I, I, I saw some of these things early on. Uh, okay, we're running. I, I, I did want you to tell the story of how you got interested in the Middle East and in Arabic. Who? You, very briefly, because it's a great story, if you would. Well, and this is a, okay, fine. I, I, I mean, I, your, your I, father, very wealthy, corning glass, no, all of this, right? So why Arabic, me, why the Middle let East? Let me confess a little bit. I, I, I wanted to go into public service in the, uh, and I, I took courses in international relations and foreign languages and so on and so forth. 
When I was at Harvard my senior year, I received a letter uh, from uh, God knows who. It was said, Dear Mr. Houghton, and there was a slight displacement between Dear and Mr. Houghton. It said, We understand you're interested in foreign languages and foreign cultures. We think you should be interested in us. And I looked down, and there was a signature down there, and up above it was Central Intelligence Agency. It was the Boston recruiter <laughs> who was asking me if I would be interested in uh, working with them. So I was sent down to Langley. Uh, I walked into the great building with the eagle on the floor, uh, turned left into the junior officer program, and within a matter of 30 or 40 minutes was offered a job virtually on the spot, provided that I accepted the military program that they required. Well, I was washed out the same day because my ears, ears, like now, couldn't hear. They were not very good and therefore I couldn't make the military program and I was told to leave. So the same day, I went back to Boston on some flight that left from Dulles and reported the following week to um, the Army recruiter because it was the days when the draft was in effect. And he sent me over to the Boston Army base. He called me terrible names, I have to tell you. And two nice doctors at the Boston Army base looked at me as I was pressing the buttons and the ear machine with my little thing, my little earmuffs on. And you could see their faces fall. Mm. Mr. Houghton, they said, you don't seem to hear very well. <laughs> I said, I suddenly realized I was about to be given three years of my life back again. But, they said, Mr. Houghton, we know you want to go in the Army, son. Get back in that machine and we'll fix it for you. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't fix it for me. State Department, this is agency culture in Washington, State Department couldn't care less all they wanted to know is if I could speak properly. Sound familiar? <laughs> Fine. So I, with, this, with these thoughts, I then decided, look, I'm not going to be, you know, this is ridiculous. I'm, thank you very much for your views that I can't hear. I'm going to study a hard language. And so at that point, I went into a British school in the hills of Lebanon, where I learned some degree of Arabic, and later on with my friend Marjorie Ransom, spent 13 months in the Foreign Service Institute, completing my Arabic language training. Marjorie then went off to Jeddah with her husband, and I went off to Amman, Jordan. Anyway, the story is basically of somebody trying to overcome some, um, some physical impediment and find, finding, the, finding, the, finding the most difficult avenue to do it, but it worked. I mean, you know. <laughs> I think that's a great story. We have time for a couple more, so let's see who is out there. Gentleman with the red sweater, and that gentleman will take your questions together. I appreciate your presentation here, it was excellent. And thank you for your generosity to send the Shah Nameh that was in your possession to Iran. Uh, based on the fact that you are an experienced diplomat, what would it take in the atmosphere that we have and the history that we've had over the past 50 years? Uh, what would it take on both Iran's side and the United States side to make the countries come together. Okay, and we'll take this guy's question and I'll repeat them for you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Paul Schwartz at CSIS. I'm curious if it's now known what happened to the Shahnameh during its four centuries of disappearance okay. between uh, Istanbul and emerging uh, back in Paris. Okay, there's a question about uh, if we know now where the Shahnameh was when it disappeared for 400 years. I would say it was an occultation knowing my Shia history, but curious if you know. Um, and the other question uh, is, what will it take to bring the United States and Iran together again? A small question for your final, <laughs> final thoughts. So maybe the, 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 uh, the one about its disappearance for 400 uh, years I, first. I can't, I can't answer the question. I, you know, it's, 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 it's one of those, impo I don't have any doubt that it can happen and will happen. I just don't. Let me put it a fine way. I, I'm, I'm, guilty of, I'm guilty of misapprehension of chronology. That is, for example, every time I th predict something will happen, it does happen only years later. <laughs> 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 and the 400 years when the Shahnameh disappeared, do you, does anybody know where it was during that period? Yes, it was in the uh, Ottoman Library. It was in the Ottoman Library. That's right. and, and how did the Rothschilds get it? This is an interesting question. I have absolutely no idea. My suspicion is that the Rothschilds were helping to finance um, uh -huh. uh, the last Sultan, Abdul Hamid, 
and um, that for whatever reason, uh, this came out either as a gift or by solicitation. I have absolutely no idea. I'm sure it wasn't walked out of the gallery, it walked out of the library by, or stolen. It's just one of those things that happens, historically speaking, and lack of appreciation of this object as an object of Persian culture, perhaps by, by, the, uh, 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 by the Ottomans. Yeah. I, have no, I have no idea about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you. It's such a great story, and uh, I think it's just uh, it, it's, it's a welcome respite, let's put it that way, from everything else that is going on in Washington these days, and especially in U.S.-Iran relations. So th thank you, Arthur Houghton, so much thank you, for coming to the Atlantic thank Council. You thank you. Well, that, was, that was fun. I